when the Taliban fell that uh, we had helicopters flying along what we consider friendly positions and they get shot at because they weren't friendly positions. Technically they were, but they people weren't. And we would complain to uh, like Fahim Khan, hey, your guys are shooting at us, tell them to stop. And he's like, no, if they're shooting at you, kill them. He says, then they're not good. And I mean, he understood the dynamics, but we didn't. You were trying to be very chivalrous, you know, and right. the, uh, as a matter of fact, we'll, I'm sure we'll get into, you know, talk with Gar where I got shot down. And, and some of that was, I couldn't shoot until being shot at, unfortunately being shot at from close range. You know, it sounds like a great idea. Look how chivalrous I am. I can, I can, you can shoot at me first before I fight you. And no, if they kill you or disable you, then it's you're done. A, but anyway, that's, done. that's a long way around to talking about Tora Bora. They kind of felt like, you know, why are we dropping bombs if we don't have to, you know, if he's dead, you know, stop dropping bombs. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I, yeah. It does, no, it, and, and I got to tell you, you know, uh, uh, when we opened the U S embassy in Kabul, uh, general Franks, who was the CENTCOM commander, uh, his guys called and said, Hey, we want you to fly him in daylight. And I said, I don't recommend it. I said, every night I go out, I get shot at. And I don't mean like a little bit. I mean like 23 millimeter RPGs, man pads. And they said, no, no, no. Afghanistan is ours. Now the Taliban fell. And that is just a little bit of, um, I can't even think of the word, but they, they just thought it was something that it wasn't, you know, and uh, they thought this situation, they wished away the threat. And so when I flew general Franks in, in the daylight, I had two surface to air missiles fired at us and I got him in safe and I had one fired on the way out. And when I reported it, they said, Oh, well, maybe he should drive out. I said, yeah, or just wait till nighttime. And they said, but we didn't think there'd be any threat. I said, I told you there'd be threat. You know, right. we, every yeah. single night we get shot at, you know? Well, well, let's talk about you getting shot down. That's actually a perfect segue. So okay. how, how far into your career does the incident occur? Like how seasoned are you at what you're doing when, yeah. when the shoot down happens? Well, let's see. I got to be uh, over 20 years of service. Uh, I've been in the 160th at that point. Let's see, eight, eight or nine years. And I'm a flight lead, which is the senior position for any warrant officer in the 160th. Uh, very few of us. So to get there, you have to be, you know, number one, you have to have the requisite talent to fly the aircraft. You have to be able to plan. You have to be able to brief. You have to be able to stay calm under pressure and execute. So me and we'll call say my peers, you know, are probably the top of the pyramid in the 160th as far as skill and experience. Right. The, you're the top of the top. You're the top of the pyramid, which is really badass and cool. So walk yeah. the viewers and the listeners through what happens when you get shot down. How'd you find yourself in the position? And what do you do once essentially, for lack of a better term, all hell is now broken loose? Well, you know, you think of being shot down as like, in you know, in the movies, uh, first of all, if it were a missile, you know, my missile engagements were, were over before I knew it. So, you know, in the movies, it'll be, you know, uh, oh, the pilot says, oh, missile two o'clock, I'm evading, you know, cutting my heat signature, you know, whatever. You'd be dead before that, you know. So what happens is the flares, the countermeasures go off on their own. They have sensors that detect missile launches. And the flares go out. And then sometimes they go off when they're not supposed to, you know, they have a false uh, launch. And so your initial thought is, unless you saw something was, oh, did we have an inadvertent flare launch? And the crew chief will say, yeah, I don't see anything or, oh, missile just went by. And that's how fast an engagement happens. The, the flares go out and then you realize that the missile just went by and missed you. It, you know, diverted because of the flares. So, you know, we went seven months, you know, without getting hit. Not a single aircraft had been hit in seven months out of the four. And then we had seven actually by the time this happened. And, you know, I talked about getting shot at every night, you know, 23 millimeters, big, big bullets. It's bigger than a 50 cal. And, you know, they usually have two or four barrel guns that shoot those things. So it's, you see it in the, in the news clips, you know, like Iraq, you know, where the, it's the bullets are snaking across the sky. You know, that stuff's getting shot at us every night. RPGs, you know, you see them go by. Um, and then the surface air missiles, we know of at least 16 that were fired at us. 
and then a couple of maybes that could have been something else, but we don't know for sure. And um, so we're kind of feeling impervious to enemy fire, you know, uh, like they can't hit us. And so uh, when I when I got hit on the top of Tarkagar, which is during Operation Anaconda, it was kind of a surprise. the The rules of engagement had just changed the day before because there was a um, uh, an, a friendly fire incident we call fratricide, where an AC-130 destroyed uh, the lead vehicle of the main effort of the fight for Anaconda, and in that vehicle was a U.S. soldier. A guy named Harriman, a warrant officer. He was leading the main force uh, in Anaconda. And he got killed. They changed all the rules. They're like, all right, you can't shoot first anymore. Now you have to be shot at before you can return fire to make sure that, you know, there's too many, there's too much confusion. You know, no one knows who's who. I mean, this thing's big. And it's one of the very first operations like this. So you, once again, you have to kind of take it with a grain of salt that, hey, this is sort of in the beginning when, all the tools that we now have for situational awareness just didn't exist. So I'm up on the mountain. Uh, a guy pops up from our left side about nine o'clock. Uh, and the gunner sees him, says, sir, I got a guy out here, left side, standing there. And then he disappears. I said, is he what? Is he armed? He's like, I didn't see anything, but, uh, you know, I don't know. And I said, all right, well, if he pops up again, kill him because in my mind at this stage, if he hasn't stayed hidden, knowing who we are, then he is a bad guy ready to engage us. So there's hostile. In my opinion, that's hostile intent. I'm not going to wait for the hostile act. Unfortunately, the guy pops up at about an 11 o'clock position and the gunner's still looking over at you know, nine and uh, lets an RPG fly. And he hits the aircraft just behind my seat and in front of the fuel tanks. So if he'd shot, you know, foot and a half to the right he'd hit the main fuel tank on the left side and if he shot foot and a half to the left he'd hit me personally so he couldn't have hit a better spot in that respect because the aircraft didn't blow up and i didn't die um but what it did do is the way rpgs work is there's like a molten jet of i think copper that you you hit the thing and it shoots through in like a stream like a like two inch two inch wide stream and as it comes through, it expands in the open space, like the crew compartment, and that overpressure kills everybody, and then it goes out the other side. And in this case, there's no overpressure because the doors are all open. It's just sheet metal. It's not a tank. And it comes through. It blows up inside, and it doesn't kill anybody. It, uh, you know, a couple of guys get some injuries, and they get kind of rattled a little bit, and um, it knocks out three different generators and it put damage to three different uh high, flight hyd hydraulic systems and there these things are all widely separated for redundancy and yet you know they all got hit so with that being said uh the aircraft is still running the cockpit goes dark so there's no no gauges no tv screens and it's very quiet because there's no cooling fans you know like a, your computer has a cooling fan right, you hear it yeah. sometimes you always hear those in the aircraft and then it's just sort of, <laughs> but the aircraft's still running. And um, so the crew chief in the back says, fire in the cockpit, fire in the cockpit, go, go, go. So we took off. And as we took off, uh, we were, we took uh, machine gun fire from what's called the Dishka. It's a 14.5 millimeter uh, anti-aircraft machine gun. And it starts ripping holes through the aircraft. And uh, during that process, Navy SEAL, uh, you know, Roberts falls out about 12 feet under the ground, which was snow covered, about knee to hip deep snow. And uh, at this stage of the game, I, I don't have any instrumentation to tell me that the rotor speed is okay, right? So the spinning of the rotor is what keeps you in the air, right? It's called a rotary wing, as opposed to flying an airplane into the wind, the blades do it for you. And so I could hear them slow down. You know, I'm used to the noise. I can tell that it's slower, but the aircraft is still running. You know, the, the engines can stay on without electricity. So we dive down the mountain with the intention to build up airspeed and auto rotate or crash at the bottom of the mountain 
using stored up kinetic energy in the rotors, right? It's a big, long explanation, but the idea is build up some speed, get the rotor RPM back and crash at the base of the mountain in a controlled crash. And hopefully we survive. Well, in the meantime, so Roberts goes out, the crew chief in the back who has a tether on grabs him. And, you know, unlike Sylvester Stallone in some movie, he doesn't, you know, hang on to him and is like, all right, I got gotcha. you. He, he gets pulled out with him. And uh, of course, Neil falls to the, to the snowy top below. Uh, the crew chief is hanging from this, you know, canvas tether. And I'm diving down the mountain at about 120 miles an hour and only about 10, 15 feet off the trees. So he's dangling probably inches from the trees and I don't know it. And the two crew chiefs up front finally regain their communications and they say, hey, we lost a guy on the LZ. And I didn't believe them. They're like, no, no, we saw him go out. And in the meantime, the other crew chief in the back is like, you know, hand over hand, pulling the other guy in from his harness. And about that time, they, they know what I'm doing now. And they go, the engines are running. Both of them are running. You don't have to go to the bottom of the hill. I was like, okay. You know, so we level off and kind of turn back around. And um, I look out, out the windows and I can see the entire battle unfolding below me, the whole Anaconda battle. I can see the terrain features. I mean, it's, it's just easy to, to see. And now I realize we've got this guy in the landing zone, Neil. And so I said, all right, we're going to go back and get him. And about that time, the controls locked up. The hydraulic fluid had leaked out of all three systems. And you can't move the controls at all. So uh, I kind of, you know, I told everybody, hey, I can't move the controls. My co-pilot tried. I think we may have bent the controls trying to move them together. Uh, but, you know, it's not going to move without hydraulics. And I just said, hey, guys, I'm, I'm sorry. We're done. You know, there's nothing I can do now. And about that time, the controls came back. Like, all of a sudden, you know, woo! It's like, you know, when you steer wheel in your car, when you unlock it, all of a sudden, whoa. And I was like, hey, I have the controls. They said, all right, we're, we're going back. So we banked back again toward the landing zone. And my crew chief that had pulled the other guy in is returning fire from one of the machine guns. Now we have three machine guns on board, two mini guns, which are electric Gatling guns. Uh, back then they were powered by AC power. So with the generators out, they didn't work. They were just sitting there and they normally shoot 4,000 rounds a minute. So he's on the old M60 machine gun in the back, returning fire to the dishka that's shooting at us. And I'm headed inbound. And about that, about 50 seconds later, the controls locked up again. And what was happening was the crew chief that was returning fire on the machine gun had these little you know, like uh, oil cans, if you will. It's hydraulic fluid. And he had a, a can opener and he'd open it up and he'd, he'd pour the fluid into this little thing and he'd, he'd pump it. He had this little tiny handle. It was like this big. And he'd, like, chick, chick, and he'd get the fluid in there. And as soon as he did, I'd have about 50 seconds worth of aircraft control. And then it would it would go all the, all the holes were on the return side. So every time I moved the controls, it squirted out, uh, fluid. And, uh, I believe he had three cans. And, uh, I realized at this point, there's no way we're going to land on the objective and get off, off the, the mountain. So I kind of banked the left headed for the main battle where I knew there was some friendly forces and started a descent, hoping to land there. Uh, while we're doing that, we get toward the bottom. I realize we're not going to make it to a friendly location. We're going to shoot long uh, just based on the angle that we're flying. And we get one last can of, of fluid. And we come down to about, I don't know, 30 feet off the ground. And I've picked a spot. And the aircraft starts to drift to the right. And I can't stop it. I can't move the controls to oppose that. So there's a saying in aviation, never quit flying the aircraft. So I didn't give up. Instead, I, I pushed on the foot pedals and the nose swung around in the direction of the drift. And at least we hit the mountain um, in the right direction, like nose first, as opposed to if we hit it sideways, we'd have rolled over, blew up, and that would have been that. And so when you hit the mountain that way, how close are you to where the enemy forces are compared to where the good guys are? I mean, what is the next plan here? Because I assume chaos is upon you at this point. So once yeah. the helicopters crash uh, with the way you kind of controlled it and brought it down, what happens next? 
Well, the first thing I thought of once we were on the ground was <laughs> an expletive. Oh, <laughs> we're alive. Uh, we shut down the aircraft, got out. We still had the SEALs on board, minus one in my crew. We set up a perimeter. We had uh, John Chapman was the aircraft controller from the 24th STS. And he contacted an AC-130 above us. They started you know, surveying the area with their sensors. And we started planning to how we're going to get back to the top of Tarkagar. And the SEALs initially thought we were at the base of the hill, but we're really about seven miles away. Uh, based on the, on the flight distance. So it was about three minutes worth of flying max. And uh, so here we were on the valley floor. We were actually north of the friendly positions and there were enemy positions all around as well. We were not under fire at this point, which is good. But we were, you know, kind of ready for that. And uh, especially with the AC-130 overhead. And eventually my wingman, so we had a, a plan that we would separate and fill our, our separate forces and then link up at an aerial rejoin point, wait 15 minutes. If someone didn't show up, you know, uh, uh, you start a radio search and if you don't find them, you got to go home because you don't have the gas to hang around, you know, we'll deal with them later. And sure enough, my wingman's waiting for me. 15 minutes is up. He's looking for me on the radio. The AC-130 hears him and says, Hey, Razor 03 is shot down over here. So Razor 04 comes around picks us up so it's about 45 minutes on the ground and uh the, the original plan was my crew would stay on the ground the seals would take my wingman back to the top of the mountain rescue neil and then come back and get us and the commander uh back in the rear said no you're not leaving an air crew sitting in the middle of a battle <laughs> move them to gardez which is you know a five minute flight away and then go up so that's what they did the wingman comes in lands and uh so you're about to say something well let's say is, is this where correct me if i'm wrong did chapman win the medal of honor he did in the, okay that's because i i always get confused who won it in this situation or so there were, it. were two two right. two of them given one to the seal team leader and one to uh the combat controller and and how much of did you witness and this is what i wanted to get to yeah. did you how close were you when the firefight when they're trying to get to roberts unfolds i was uh eight miles away at okay ford operating base gardez watching gotcha. it on uh, uh isr so i'd watch it on the predator but i wasn't there. there were no u.s forces above that could watch it it was all uh drone footage gotcha yeah so uh but well, that is one of the that might be the craziest story we've ever heard on American Joyride. First shot, first shoot down story. Was there any point when you got shot down and you were going down where you thought, "This is it. I'm not living to see tomorrow. Like I'm going to die yeah. right here, right well, now." It, each time I couldn't control the aircraft, I thought we were dead. And uh, especially at the end, when the the last bit of fluid was used and the aircraft was sliding to the right, all I could think of is, "Well, we came close." And I just didn't give up, you know, which most pilots won't, you know, they'll just keep flying the damn thing till they don't exist anymore. That's absolutely incredible. I can't imagine being in a situation like that where a guy's pumping hydraulic fluid via yeah. cans and you got 50 seconds, less than one minute. He's a stud. I mean, and we didn't know that at the time. That was like an after the fact kind of like, all right, right well, let's right. see. We were flying for about three and a half minutes and, you know, so about 50 seconds per can. 